Yeah. You know, marriage becomes like a a, a brand. Sure. Married pastor mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. kids, church preacher. You know, you know that. It sounds so clean. Oh yeah, and perfect. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah it, that, that unit. So sure. it's like a brand. It's, yeah. it's like you build your sense of identity even around that, and when that is shaken, you just don't know who you are now. Mm -hmm. You know, I ended up asking myself questions to say, "Am I still a pastor?" Introducing the epitome of luxury living. Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits. I, I, I'll I try and be more cultured because mm -hmm. it, it seems as if Kune, I'll, I'll say this in Zulu, yeah. which means there is a, a conglomerate of people who are Obsessed with saying I don't greet. How, how are you, Indomiso? <laughs> <laughs> you don't greet your guests. Oh come on, guys! <laughs> like I greeted them before we went camera. Exactly. You know, I'm I'm trying to be as organic as possible. Yeah, 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 yeah man. Uh, do you want the do you want the short answer or the long answer? That's that's uh, the question. <laughs> uh, uh, let's start with the short answer, yeah, and man. then we will get into the details. Yeah, man. I'm 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 good, Lunga. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for asking. Um, I'm really holding on. Uh, it's getting better and better every with each day. Yeah, yeah, honestly. Um, you ever since we've been here, as I'm saying, to just give people a context of how we we we've been chatting off cam. Yeah, you seem alive, which is good. You seem um like you're in a space where you're ready to face the world again. Um, which is something that is oh my gosh, I remember, I remember 2015 April 26 was the day of my mother's funeral. Yeah, and 2015, yes, and. April 28th, the Monday, life went on. And then I was still in university at the time. I was in third year engineering. And then I, went, I thought I could go to class. And then I went to class. Yes, I've. life goes on, guys. We can't be stuck here. Yeah. I went to class in the first lecture. And then I cried in class. Hey. And then my friends just walked me out. Yeah. Um, I got into my vehicle and I drove back home. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, are you still there? As we speak, I think we are like uh, eight weeks since my mom uh, passed. Mm -hmm. um, and people who are at a distance, who might uh, connect with me mostly through the phone or social media, would have the same perception. Would, okay, it seems like I'm alive, I'm ready to tackle the world again. Sure. Um, I'll be very honest with you that me showing up uh, for anything right now in, in my life, uh, whether it's my podcast or church ministry or parenting relationships, it, it's really a work of therapy and medication. You've been a pastor for how many years? Since 2008. Eight. So there was no official ordination, but before that I was functioning for like six years before that. Sure. So two plus 10 plus four, 16 years officially. Officially ordained, yeah. But I've officially. I've been preaching since the age of 18. More than 20 years preaching. Um, 
which means you are well versed in the Bible. You are well versed in God, the Comforter. Yeah. You are well versed in God, the Protector. You are well versed in God, the one you can run to, your shield, sure. your refuge. You've got a verse, a reference to all of that. Sure. You've been born again, which means, um, for the lack of a better word, as born again Christians, because of repetition and consistency of church all the time and conferences and the things we attend, our brains become indoctrinated to believe, love, understand God mm -hmm. to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. With that 20 years of this believe, love, understand God, why isn't Omiso failing to deal with this in a God is my protector? Yeah, yeah. I, I learned a long time ago um, that as beings, we are three in one, we're three parts of, of us, of our beings, mm -hmm. which is our spirit, uh, our soul. Mm -hmm. The soul includes the mind, will, and emotions. So, sure. And then our bodies. And all, all these three parts of us, these three entities of us, can be in different states at the same time. So, so you could be healthy in your body, mm -hmm. healthy in your spirit, mm -hmm. which means, I mean, our spirits is like God. It, our spirits connect to God very easily. Mm -hmm. When the word says we are made in the image and the likeness of God, sure. it's not talk about how we look, mm -hmm. but it's our spirit. Mm -hmm. It's our nature. So you can be fine with that and be able to quote verses and pray and speak in tongues and mm -hmm. go to church and sing. But here's where the problem is. It's in the soul mm -hmm. for me right now. Mind, will, emotions. And there I am in utter turmoil. I'm in utter turmoil, uh, even physically a bit with my back, which is another longstanding issue. Yeah. But um, we must understand that when you're not okay emotionally and psychologically, mentally, it's not a sign that something's wrong with you in, in your spiritual life or in your faith because there you are fine. But so why am I feeling this way? Because there's a big entity inside of me, which is my soul, which is hugely injured right now. And uh, for a large part of my walk with God, I would use what's happening in my spirit to mask the state and the condition of my soul hmm. and run away from depression, run away from anger, run away from my emotional state, quote it, sugarcoat it in, in, in spiritual language and Christianese and, and scripture, mm -hmm. uh, do that and do that. But when I'm by myself, you know, those few minutes before you try sleep where you're you're like naked to yourself, your mm -hmm. thoughts are coming, then you realize I got issues. So I decided a, a, a while ago that I'm going to be very honest to myself about how I am. And I'm going to be very honest and vulnerable as well to those who choose to be around me. Mm -hmm. And I'll remove the mask. So I'm not intimidated uh, by standing... In, on any size of platform and saying I'm not okay mm -hmm. or pointing out a weakness or a sure. mistake of my own sure. or a fault or a, like, yeah, yeah, like a fault that I have done, a shortcoming. I am very vulnerable. And uh, I used to teach, speak, and preach from a state or a position of strength and okay. knowledge. Okay. Now, my instruction from God uh, not just now because my mom has passed, but for the past four or five years, I now teach, speak, preach from a place of vulnerability. Interesting point because it, it goes it goes back to what was involved in me as yeah. as you are as you are speaking. Yeah, you say you 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 preach from a point of vulnerability. Yeah, obviously this conversation that we're having is centered around the grief that you're currently going through because of your mom. Sure. Um, not just your mom, but as we continue, we'll speak about sure. it too. Um, four or five years ago, I believe, is the period in which you were divorced. Correct. That's grief on its own. Huge. Huge grief, man. Um, there is no happily ever after <laughs> divorce. You know, you, you will rebuild your life. Yes, you will find love again. 
you will you'll be okay. That's, that's not what I mean. But there's no just clean, happy divorce. You know, when I see people who go through divorce and they start throwing divorce parties and cutting divorce cakes and having ceremonies to burn their wedding gowns, I'll tell you that that's fake. Hmm. That's fake. Even if you were wronged in that marriage, even if there was abuse, even if the right decision was to come out of that marriage and you are the one who filed, that thing hurts mm -hmm. like crazy. Mm -hmm. I, my theory is divorce is like a near-death experience. So, yeah. So, so divorce is hard. Um, again, it impacted on my mental health, my physical health, even my, my, my spiritual health. Mm -hmm. um, I carry a lot of uh, guilt uh, still in some aspects of that, particularly when it comes to my children, mm -hmm. uh, just because I'm no longer living with them anymore and I don't get to spend all the time that I'd love to spend with them as a parent who would... Who would you took be, away a family from them, basically. You, you know what I'm saying? Of yeah. That they had a family yeah. unit and it was ripped apart. Yeah, yeah. and also um, an issue I had to work through was the guilt of uh, the fact that I really believe in marriage and family. I'm an advocate for it. And I've, I've always been the guy who spoke at relationship and marriage events. I'm a relationship coach and all of that. So how can this guy then be the one to go through this? You know, um, and so I went through an identity crisis mm. um, mm. after uh, that, that, that divorce. But you part of the healing process is to get that closure and to and to get better perspective on where you are and who you are and to realize that God has not disqualified you. Yeah. Would you say part of the grief and the identity crisis was that in the hierarchy of how you identified yourself, there was God, Ndomiso who loves God, and Ndomiso married, Ndomiso family man, and then everything else. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, marriage becomes like a... Uh, a brand, so sure. married pastor mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. kids, church preacher. You know, you know that it sounds so clean. Oh yeah, perfect. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah it, that that unit. So sure. it's like a brand. It's, yeah. it's like you build your sense of identity even around that, and when that is shaken, you just don't know who you are now. Mm -hmm. You know, I ended up asking myself questions to say, "Am I still a pastor? Am I still?" Am I still a child of God right now? Because I've just decimated this institution that I believe in so much. But also now I am a divorced pastor. And, you know, treatment in, within the church of people who are divorced is, is not nice. Mm -hmm. It's worse for divorced pastor. It's scandalous. It's dirty. People avoid you as if this thing is contagious. Mm -hmm. In fact, women will tell you, I mean, well, not only women, but... Uh, um, Christian couples, uh, you know, their women would would tell their husbands, don't be friends with him because you know, so it's it becomes a lonely a lonely journey. Uh, I managed to come up of out of that, also resurface out of that mud, uh, uh, the, the stigma, of divorce, and the depression around it, through just really understanding uh, the grace of God. Mm -hmm to learn, first of all, that when I did have the perfect picture of Ndumiso, the preacher, the married guy, and all of that, and when I was doing, quote-unquote, well, it was not because of me. It was because of the grace of God. Uh, and, 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 and what the same thing that qualified me back then, when I, I had no scandal, to come back into it again, to come back into my purpose my ministry to rise again, it will also happen through the grace of God. Someone will ask, what makes you qualify now to be able to stand in front of couples or, or, or run marriage ceremonies or preach in a church, whereas you went through a divorce? The same thing that saved me from my life of sin back then when I had a relationship with God, which is grace, is the same thing that qualifies me to function for God, mm -hmm. not my Christian CV. Sure, sure. Who uh, on, on on that on that notion of grace? Um, 
she spoke to Mvumile Dwaba and she said that, um, I, I, I might be wrong with timelines, it was either towards the end of last year or beginning of this year, um, she had she got, she got into a fast for a few days. Yeah. After fasting, she then gave herself to God all over again mm. at church. Mm. And then she realized after she gave herself to God that she had been holding guilt of being a divorcee. Yeah. Of guilt of being this woman who had ticked all the boxes, gotten yeah. married as a virgin, yeah. served her partner, her husband as a married woman, and then it just shattered yeah. and she's getting divorced. Yeah. People are seeing the Shlier who's a worshipper, who's changing people's lives, but she didn't realize that she was carrying guilt of being a divorced woman. Yeah. How deep does this guilt go of being a divorced person, especially as a person who's branded to be a born again believer? It runs extremely deep. Uh, one thing I have in, in common with Uche, um is that we are both PKs now. Okay. There's another dynamic, mm -hmm. pastor's kids. Now, the pressure that comes from being a pastor's kid is, 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 is another level. We are expected to be perfect. We are expected... Our parents are uh, expected to be able to hold strong families that are perfect, raise the perfect kids. We're not allowed to be human. So a lot of the guilt comes because we've hurt the community, the church community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We've disappointed the church community. We, we have added, we feel like we've added another layer to the stain that's in the church. divorce. You feel like now, now I'm sure, and I'm supposed to be the leader. I'm supposed to know better, right? Yeah. Another source of the of the guilt is the fact that there is this contradiction inside of you that is so deeply personal. There's a contradiction between what I believe, what I know, versus the lived experience that I'm going through and you're struggling to reconcile the two. How can I believe in family so much? How can I believe in God so much who can do anything? But my lived experience is, is totally something else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This, and I just don't have a, an answer <laughs> for this. And it, it's, it, it, it makes us feel like we are hypocrites. And then, therefore, the guilt is there. So um, we also feel guilty because of the standards we put on ourselves as Christians and ministers and people who are in the uh, forefront in certain ways, put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Oguti, Gumele, Ngibe, this way, I must present myself this way. I must always be on a pedestal. I must always uh, maintain a brand. Uh, I must always, you know, be, be, be. Um, and, and, and while I'm performing and trying to be that, everything that is holding that picture up could be crumbling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm so preoccupied with performing and showing the picture that I neglect reinforcing the foundations or the structure mm -hmm. that are holding this thing up, you know. And and ministry became, ministry challenges became one of those things for me, which I was so focused on ministry challenges and life challenges that I lost sight. I lost sight of the marriage, you know, something that I thought I would never do because I would I've preached against that. Uh, and I've, I've done so from a place of arrogance sometimes. Mm. You know, uh, with the, ah, um, as a pastor, man, you neglect your family. You know, your family is your first ministry. I've said all those kind of things. And then still I find myself in that situation. You know, it, it, it hits on your self-worth. Now that you're operating on a place of gear, of rather, of grace, Mm. Where you understand the grace of rebuilding of rebuilding yourself, and you now don't live from that place of guilt. Yeah, so yeah. Now you're in a place of grace. Mm. Why do you believe you can now operate in a place of grace 
And do you still believe divorce is a sin? Um, I've never believed uh, divorce is a sin. It's not in the Bible, which divorce is a sin. I don't believe divorce is a sin. God says, I hate divorce. He does say that. It's not a sin. Um, and by saying that, I'm, I'm not frivolously saying anyone should just jump into it and do it because they, the, 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 the family and the marriage unit is so important to God. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he, he, it's, it's so important to him. But it's not really a sin. Um, and also by saying I'm operating in grace can be so easily misunderstood, Uguti. We use the word grace to give us license to live anyhow mm -hmm. and, and, and excuse our wrongdoing just because there is a, the grace of God. But the grace of God doesn't license sin, doesn't empower us to sin. In fact, if we really read the word of God, the grace of God is the thing that strengthens us against sin and breaks us out of the bondage of sin. This is the grace of God. Um, many of us operate in a place of self righteousness mm -hmm. where we think and feel that my good behavior and my good acts and me acting right and speaking right is what it means to be righteous and, and to be holy. Uh, even the Bible says, again, says your works are like filthy rags in front of God. We are not qualified by what we do. It's, it, to be a child of God and to be anything in the kingdom of God, I'm talking, I'm talking even about the, the person, the man or woman who's being used by God the most in the world, who's got a huge following of people and they minister to them. It's by grace. It's not because they are so good. It's by grace. And so we should move from a place of self-righteousness. I deserve the blessings of God because I am good. You are not good. I am not good. But it's the grace of God that enables us to live a life that is beyond our, our physical and natural you know, standards. When I lost my mom, I felt like I lost the best friend. I lost the only person in this world who will ever do things for me and by me unconditionally yeah. with Limited, weird expectations. Um, what did your mom mean to you? Man, um, my mom was my biggest cheerleader, my biggest support, my biggest prayer warrior, my biggest caregiver. My mom was still taking care of me, even in adulthood. Um she would check on me daily, weekly, just to check how I'm doing, and uh, and be and was very specific, you know, in making sure she knows where I am, and her 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 interest in my well-being is unmatched. Um, there's no human being who's ever been so interested in seeing Undumiso be all that God wants him to be, mm. like my mom. Um, my mom was strict, a disciplinarian. Um, in my younger years, that manifested in a lot of discipline and hidings, a lot of no's, if we you know, wanted to do things so. We were not those kids who were allowed to go to groove, um, you know, and which for me, it put me in a complex where I was frustrated as a, as a teen, feeling that I don't fit in um, with my peers. And I was trying very hard to fit in with my peers. And I became the, the weird and odd one out in many circles throughout um, high schooling, because we come from different backgrounds. But Akaya were a, a, a God-believing family. So mo my mom taught me the right way, is the right of, of living, the difference between right and wrong. She reinforced um, our spiritual lives with God. Uh, she taught us prayer. 
um, um, she displayed faith. Her second name was Faith. Tandi with Faith Mazibu. Sitole was her maiden surname. She had amazing faith. And I th- more and more I'm thinking about this faith aspect. Well, mind you, our view of faith right now in the church is that your faith is seen in the car you drive, house you live in. Your faith brings money from heaven. Your faith does this and this. Um, my mom had a kind of faith not in what God can do, but in who God is. Hmm. That's the kind of faith she had. Fast forwarding to her last days even on earth, she would be the one encouraging all of us with scriptures and prayer during that time. While you guys are falling apart. We are stressed. Yeah. Bro, I've lost so much weight. I'm stressed. Moving up and down, trying to help her with her, you know, her medical treatment because she had cancer. Uh, and Lapo, even though I would see, would t- it is very hard for her. Physical pain, emotional strain, um, the worry about how my dad is, how we are, how the church is. She still continued caring for others while she was in this, in this bad state. But still, she never changed her confession or what comes out of her mouth about God. Mm-hmm. You know, now, now, now that is real faith. My youngest brother at the funeral said something so critical relating to what I'm saying in his, in his speech. He said, uh, and I'll paraphrase with it, Umama, where I'm called, I'll translate now. Umama, where I'm called, I'm going to go to the Koda waiti noma unkunukene ngamphilisi wayezofa kwaziwa ukuthi wayekholiwe hmm. you know what she trusts god for healing she believes god can heal and god is a healer but even if god does not heal her and she transitions she will die it being known that she believed god hmm. and that's exactly an accurate representation of that woman's faith. And that's the kind of faith she demonstrated for us. You believe God, not because of what you have, but because of who he is. You believe God, not because of what uh, he can do for you, but because of who he is in your life. You know, And, and that's the kind of, 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 of woman I've lost. That's the kind of presence I've lost. I've lost a presence where my mom was a fixer. My mom was a fixer, um, <laughs> and I, I, I would see something in her eyes when a problem arose. Like, in King Amayvela, like, you're like, hey, you guys, we are stressed, there's a problem. But I would see something in her when a problem was there, some, some spark in her eyes, because something was activated in her, because then she would start putting things in place. She was activated by problems. She was a fixer. Not happy that something's going wrong, but her purpose was to fix and arrange and, 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 and just bring calm and direction. And so this played out also in the life of the family, not just the, uh, our close family, but extended family. During funerals, she was that anchoring presence, that, 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 that advisor, that person who would say, no, let's not do it this way, let's do it that way. I'm not talking about rich aunt vibes, mm-hmm. the bullies and the, the controlling ones, but the person who would come as a voice of reason mm-hmm. and wisdom in a solution situation. Based. Yeah, solution-based. Yeah. And so extended families on her side of the family and on my dad's side of the family relied on her wisdom and anchoring and presence so much during such things. Um, and two weeks after she died, um, one of our cousins passed away was the daughter to my dad's sister. Hmm. Dies also of cancer, right? And my one of my aunts sends me a message at Tiazin. We're having the family meeting is all because there's normally a family meeting. I was on Sure. Guys, what are we doing this week? Yeah. During the family meeting, we missed her. Because we were all saying that right now 
direction will be so much clearer mm. for this whole week because of, of, of your mom. Uh, and, and that's the kind of person as she is. Her last message to me on WhatsApp um, was, how is your back? This person is in pain. Petre, Critically ill. Listen, ooh, ooh, this person just came out of hospital, not doing well. And then she's going to ask me, how am I doing? How, how's your back, son? I, I, I didn't answer that. <laughs> I couldn't answer that. I mean, I, because I was not having a good time with my back. I was really mm-hmm. struggling at mm-hmm. that time. Mm-hmm. My stress sometimes manifests through... Physically. My, my, yeah, physically, yeah. especially. And my back is a low-hanging fruit mm-hmm. because of the surgery I had. So even in her last days, she was still caregiving. When she f- knew and sensed so good she, she is about to go, I, you see through some of the things that she was doing, which she was trying to still care for us. My dad told us a story after the funeral that on that last night when she passed, because she passed away 3 a.m., on that line, she says to my dad, I think it's better if you go sleep at the other house, which is my dad's parents' house, mm-hmm. the main Mazibugo house. Mm-hmm. Something very weird Something that was my dad has never done. My dad says, "Why? Why, man? Why would not? Because I think my sisters are coming, or my sisters are here. So it's space. Like, no, there's space. We have our own bedroom. There are two other bedrooms. What do you mean?" Sure. And my dad told us after that that he realized, no, he she was trying to save him from seeing her transition because she was so worried about how he's gonna do. Mm. You know, that is the person that we lost. Someone who would call me out uh, concerning destiny issues, decisions that are not right, yeah. that need to be, that are going to affect me negatively. Um, you know, like I said, she was a disciplinarian, so she, was, she didn't shy away from confrontation. <coughs> yeah. She didn't shy away from confrontation. She would give it and in a loving way. And of course now, not being young anymore, it was not hidings, so it you know it was the talk. She'll sit you down and talk. So you just get a phone call randomly. I address in that, you know, I in that bit. Yeah. Mom wasn't an ordinary woman, as you say. Um, you you've went into detail of how, yeah. even in her last days, she wanted not only to be remembered as, but she identified as a woman of faith. She lived in faith, and she loved God with her entirety. I've loved God with my entirety for three, four decades, serving through building a church and all the trauma that comes with building a church, the challenges, uh, what it does to your family structure, how it affects your relationship with your kids. God, why is a person who's done all of that being put into so much pain yeah. and having cancer? Surely, in our Christian faith, somewhere, somehow, I've heard that if my actions are good, then I will be rewarded rightfully so. Mm-hmm. That question you're raising is a great source of anger for me right now. <laughs> you know, um, and uh, perhaps part of my grief process, but I'm quite angry about how Things happened, and and you know, towards the end of her life, I would have loved to see someone who served God all their lives, and given so much into the ministry, like she has done. I think my parents have given millions over the course of these forty years, being married and serving God collectively mm-hmm. into the ministry. This thing, you go to uh, are in ministry to get rich. I've never seen that. I've never seen that, <laughs> let alone in my family. Mm-hmm. We've always been just a normal family. Sure. And, we've, and there were times we really struggled. Yeah, financially even. Uh, my mom was a career woman. My dad then was full-time ministry. Uh, we struggled. But the way she pushed and put us into good schools and she became present and going to work in a day, see, to go care for other people. I'm mm-hmm. seven as a nurse. 
your husband is not here because he's preaching good, good, good. You've got four kids here, boys who are teens and, you know, finding themselves. And then time went on where they founded their own ministry. And there she just became the, the, the pillar, you know, of ministry, kept things going, got things done in the ministry, was so faithful by my dad's side as they built together. I ask God that those questions. Kanji. Kanja. Do you have an answer yet? I, I, I don't. And and I I I'm accepting perhaps that I won't get an answer to some questions I'm asking. I I'm accepting, learning to accept that some questions are triggered by grief. Uh, and there won't be any satisfactory answer ever. We would see how can it end like that for such a person. But also, I, I, then I remember some things that I've even preached to myself, Uguti, whether we are close to God, you know, how much we serve God, how much we love God, it doesn't exempt us from the challenges of life. So I remember, mm-hmm. if now it's easy to preach it. You'll get amen. You get people standing and clapping for you when you preach that. Now I'm living it. Mm-hmm. Now it's another story. Does our faith then, as you're saying, you've preached before that challenges of life you're not exempt from as a believer, but you we've also, once again, there's a doctrine that says, as a believer, is vum vum, but I will be in the fire, but yeah. God will be in the fire with me. Sure, sure. Um, does it feel like God is in the fire with me, though, when I'm in such severe pain? Am I not supposed to have some sort of shield when I'm in the fire? Because that doctrine once again says that I come out of the fire unscathed. You know what I'm saying? Um, the, 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 the part of that doctrine that says unscathed could be an invention hmm. that we have added mm-hmm. as people. Mm-hmm. Unscathed. Mm, no. When I look at people who went through tough things in the Bible, who were used by God, but they had a story, and God, and they went through hard stuff, and God still used them. Talk about your Abrahams, your Jacobs, your Davids, and all of that. The things they went through did scathe, did scathe them. Sure. They did lose stuff. They did have permanent scars. Jacob wrestled with God, and he wasn't left with a limp for life. Mm-hmm. You know, his, mm-hmm. his, his, his hip was, you know, moved out of socket. You will get scared. You will, there will be signs that you went through it. It won't be a wound to be a scar, but uh, what I hold on to in, mm-hmm. in context of what you're asking is what the word says in Isaiah, which no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Um shooting. The weapons will be formed. The attacks will come. The circumstances will come against us. But every attack from, from, from the enemy's perspective has got a certain purpose to fulfill in your life when it's being sent your way. Mm-hmm. The circumstance when it's being sent your way, it must do something destructive to you. Now, God says, I will prevent that purpose to be fulfilled. But if something was sent to you to cause you to commit suicide... If that was the purpose, if that was the aim, it won't happen. But Abu Shubuti, the thing, when things happen in our lives, we are unfeeling. We don't get wounds, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but it's very true, Lunga uh, and in the fire, God is with us. Yeah. Uh, I'm learning that, you, back again to the grace word, the grace uh, principle, which the grace of God is a sustainer when we go through fires. There are, there are people going through what I'm going through right now yeah. in which area of my life, and they are far worse. Some have died. Some are in mental hospitals. Some have committed suicide. Whatever. Uh, some, someone heard that their mom passed. They, they tried to drive home to go and organize their funeral, and they made a mistake on the road, and they died. Hmm. I'm still standing. I'm in the situation. I'm saying to you, 
uh, you asked me earlier on how am I even showing up, and I'm saying to you, it's therapy, it's medication. That's that the fact that I'm sitting here. You know, basically, I'm saying without these, I'm a mess, man. I'm a totally a mess. I, do, I don't get out of bed. But somehow, it's appeal. It's a grace. I'll push it even further. There's a there's a believer out there who says, Ndomiso, you are still not making sense because you not being able to get out of bed, you living off medication means that the weapons are prospering. It's just that you didn't commit suicide or you're not in a mental hospital. It's just that mm. it degrees to how much the weapons prosper. Mm. Is God still with you mm. if you are living in such problematic circumstances or mm. painful circumstances rather? Yeah. Um, and you are you are still trying to convince me that mm. God is with me in this season. Absolutely. Um, God's breakthroughs or his interventions do not always result in quick and overnight turnarounds. The stuff we go through to heal from it and to get out of it, most of the times there is a process, a process we can't bypass. Okay, so I believe that I'll be fine, so, you no know, mentally, physically, but there's a process that God has given me to go through and use uh, in order to be helped. So I'm going through my process. I'm going through my process. I'm going through the therapy. That's my process. I can't just say, I've got faith, hallelujah, hallelujah, fire, fire. Sure. I don't need therapy. I don't need medication. That's not God's will for us. There's a process. My, my Personally, my healing, my breakthrough is pro is pro what's it's progressive it's a process i will um, i'm and in this process i see god strengthening me i see myself little by little there's a one percent daily improvement in time that i can identify there are days where i go really low and i absolutely don't see a way forward and i'm kumnyama and i sh black out and i shut down and i'm so exhausted i can't even work i can't do anything I can interact with the people in my life. There are days like that. But also, even there, I'm still alive. Mm -hmm. I've still got something to be grateful for. There's still shelter. There's still food I can eat. I still have my dad. I still have a parent. Mm -hmm. I still have family. My brothers are here. My sisters are here. I still have. I still have a, a, a brain. I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you in this state, but I'm speaking like a person, I'm speaking on a level of eloquence of a person who's not going through anything. Sure. There's no way that I cannot see God in my situation. Sure. <laughs> I'll push you further. Um, and you can tell me if I'm pushing too much. No you know when we're in, you know when we're in pain mm. or we're in a traumatic situation, that was stiff, especially one that is unforeseen. Be that you were in a car accident and you were hijacked, you were kidnapped. You know, those type of situations that plunge us into trauma yeah. without any preparation, hey. right? like the grief that you're going through. Yeah. Um, it makes us irrational a bit. Yeah. Or even a lot. Did you does it did it ever plunge you to a point where you called your ex-wife and you wanted to cry to her, specifically her. No, uh, that didn't happen. Um, I cried to her in as far as the children were concerned. Okay. Um, you know, earlier in the year, I said, I said to her, listen, um, I need to sensitize you of a situation that's going on, you know, a kai. And uh, I'm not. I, I'm not saying Uting Tin, but in front of us, you know, what anything can happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I made her aware of my mom's diagnosis, uh, because as the mother to the kids, yeah, she had to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And a couple of months down the line, I had a second conversation with her about that. Uguti, uh, situation is not looking good. Yeah, I'm just sensitizing you, just. You know, okay. yeah. So n never personally uh, would I ever miss her shoulder. No. It, it's interesting because it, it, you know when you, you know when you're going through a lot. Now you are because your brain is in overdrive and you're yep. overthinking. 
And I'd be like, maybe if I was still marrying this way, <laughs> this way yeah. maybe I shouldn't have made the yeah. decision. You know, that, that's yeah. what I'm trying to get into. I get you. The, the person who's watching or listening to this, they need to understand that even those irrational thoughts are okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. L- l- listen, guys, um, we, we, we must not deny or ignore the emotional part of ourselves, of our beings. Sure. No matter how much we are people of faith, no matter how educated you are, let's move away from faith, no matter how educated you are, how, how, how much you know scientifically about life and all of that, you can't deny that there is a deeply emotional part of you and it's okay to feel. Consider this, right? Uh, I've got a therapy, I mean, a, a therapist who's helping me with tremendous competence and wisdom navigate my pain. And they can do that for that hour or two hour session. And then after that, they go and live their lives. Hey, no. Gosh. <laughs> they go and live their lives. They surely do. You know? <laughs> uh, they can go and hang out with their mom. Yes. Without thinking about Dumiso's mom who's no longer here. So they can go do that without feeling depressed. Mm-hmm. They're, they're trained to do it. Yeah. She, she knows the ins and outs and the anatomy of depression and grief. She knows all of that. But if her mom were to be sick, she, a part of her would be activated and it would supersede her book knowledge. The knowledge at the Caesar, hundreds of patients, and I, as I was, manji, we said in this for herself. Mm-hmm. Because mind you, this thing now has hit her. So with that, with that analogy, I'm trying to say, we can't deny that we have an emotional part of ourselves. And the emotional side of us, it is normal, guys, and it is natural for it to have highs and lows. If that doesn't happen, we are no longer alive. There's something wrong. Yeah, yeah, There's something yeah. wrong. So even at your peak, spiritually, and then you feel something emotionally that's not right, or you feel in a particular way in your psyche that's not right, don't discount your, your, your spirit strength, <laughs> if I can put it that way, or your spiritual life strength. Yeah, yeah. Don't, 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 don't write it off because you're feeling this way. You are just going through something normal, a normal reaction. Yeah. So there's this version of Christianity or faith that wants to just nullify being human. And God doesn't want us to stop being human. The shortest verse in the Bible, I think it's John, is it 10 or 11? John 11 verse 35, and Jesus wept. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Two weeks after your mom passes, you lose your sister cousin. Yeah. My goodness, do you, at the time it happens and you get the news, what, what is your immediate reaction? And do you believe you have the capacity to handle that as the news comes in? When that comes in, man, I am like, what the hell? I used another word that was, is not so holy, but like, it's like, what the hell? Like, like now? Now? You know? I, I didn't believe I would, uh, you know, just be able to just get into funeral mode again and start supporting and planning. I did, but I was just in disbelief. Huh. Funeral mode. I t- yeah. I hate it so much. <laughs> so much. Yeah. Funeral mode, funeral mode stands to be in a competition <laughs> with the actual death, with, yeah. with how traumatizing it is. You, yeah. you, you know, and I find myself managing to sort of get into funeral mode. Yeah. And then after that, you know, now I'm processing grief on a double level. You know, my cousin and my mom now. And now questions are are being added on personally. Questions in my head. Because I'm now this, now this, now this. And the funny thing is that when my mom was still in the hospital, because my mom got discharged two weeks before she actually passed, mm-hmm. um, just before she got discharged, this cousin of mine, goes and, and is admitted into the same hospital. So we're dealing with, at that point, we're dealing with three relatives, same time, who were in hospital. 
you know, there's another older one who was in the hospital as well. And he was like, Kosi, I'm I have no idea what's going on. Here. So when we enter this hospital, we need to do a tour. tour. In visiting hours. Yeah. We're we giving you 30 minutes. We're giving you 30 yeah. minutes. Yeah, because... We're splitting up as members. Uh, because I was visiting my mom, and then there was a separation of a... a, a so it's my mom's bed, and then all the other patients sure. in that little room. But still in, the, still in the same ward, just separated by a wall, was another side. And... That's where my um, grandmother's sister was. was admitted. So technically, they were in the same ward. And then you finish here. I out in your check and I look Go, go visit. Come back to mom. And then you hear, Omunye is in another section of the hospital. And you're like, hi. Yeah, when are this one? <laughs> yeah, you're like, hi. I, I, uh, I don't know how to explain yeah. what I'm going through. People yeah. often say... Um, Sorry to cut you there. Yes. I often say, I, 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 I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Do you agree with what you're going through? Is something that you feel that way with? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I do. Um, generally, I, I mean, I, I seldom ever wish anything bad on anybody, no matter what you see. But definitely, I, I, do not wish, I do not wish the stuff I've been through on anybody. I don't wish anybody can go through divorce. I don't wish... Anybody can go through the pain of loss that I'm going through right now. I know that it's inevitable. We will bury our parents. We will bury our loved ones. But Senati, <laughs> my answer to someone else, uh, man, what I'm feeling, may they not feel it because it's it's it's, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. It's 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 horrible. And yes. Everybody will have their own grief journey to go through. It's important to feel. Oh man, but I wish I could save some people from it. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's horrible. As somebody watching this, um, this podcast, in, in, in fact, um, one of our last few episodes, only 42.6% were South Africans who watched it. Interesting. So this podcast penetrates race, gender, sexuality, religion, yeah. a belief system. Uh, the bulk of our conversation, because this is how you identify and how you deal with your grief, has been about how God has been your shelter. Someone out there does not have a relationship with God. Do you think outside of God you would have been able to deal with this and how? And I would understand why you would, uh, you know, frame the question like that, would you, I'm using God as my shelter because I, I've spoken so much about God, right, in our time together this morning. Uh, but if I, if I confess to you and to everyone who's watching right now, I don't know how good I, I am being right now at, at, at leaning on God. Hmm. My prayer life is not where it should be. It doesn't even exist. Barely. Okay. Barely. Yeah, fair. You know, I'm cautious of taking the credit. You would I, I'm using God. Uh, I've got a formula. That God. <laughs> um, right now, in relation to God, I'm standing on what I know to be true about mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. The fact that He is God, He mm -hmm. He loves me. So I'm standing on that. I don't feel it. I see it in the fact that I am still alive. I'm managing to show up here and there. I'm seeing the, the net result of it, and I know that can't be me. Can't be me. But I don't feel powerful. <laughs> I don't feel uh, anointed. I don't feel on fire for God. Um, I'm not questioning his existence. I just don't feel him. Um, in that way. So I don't think I'm being very good in that or I, 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 don't have, I don't have a formula 
you go, okay, if you're going through grief and you want to lean on God, do this, this, this. Now, I think right now God is doing more of the work in our relationship so, than me. So, just for clarity, do you believe healing, true healing, ultimate healing from grief is possible outside of Christianity? Uh, yes, it is. Because, again, uh, when you are bereaved and you are grieving, the part of you that gets damaged is your soul. Um, when you believe in God, the part of you that is activated and made alive is your spirit. So when you are not connected to God or don't have a relationship with God, your spirit man is dead, but your soul is still alive. And yes, if you go through something like this, it will it will be damaged. So there are ways, Zoguti, you can uh, be healed in that area. Um, there are people who've lost loved ones before having a relationship with God, and they healed. They did therapy, they did whatever. Maybe they self-medicated on stuff they're not supposed to, but they've healed, but right. Later on in life, they meet God. Um... Now, that person was not actively using their relationship with God to heal and to get forward, but they still did because the soul was being addressed. Mm. But, but having said that, at the end of the day, when you consider life and from a, a bird's eye view, from a paranormal view, you step back and you zoom out on life, you realize that even when we don't acknowledge God, even when during those times we didn't believe in God, God through his mercy was keeping us. It was him keeping us. We thought it was this and that, but, but it was really God uh, uh, um, still keeping us, preserving us for a day where we will one day, yes, uh, receive him, have a relationship with him, depend on him, worship him. But um, really, um, without God, there is no life, you know. Um, but certainly, you can heal from psychologically traumatic events and wounds, even if you don't have a relationship with God. Grief doesn't have, rather, grief doesn't have a duration that you can place where there is a start and an end. I'm told that. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you, uh, because my biggest grief moment was the loss of my mom. Uh, my personal experience was, I'm sorry to say this, because you're only eight weeks in the first three years, yeah. but not mass. Um, the first three years, year one, there is a bit of an acceptance, anger, Year two, their their acceptance is there, but now there is I, I don't know you're you you're heightened to everything you're heightened to mm. annoying things like Mother's Day mm. it's annoying mm. you're heightened to favorite songs mm. to birthdays you're heightened to everything that mm. signals or uh, uh, is a, a reminder of the relationship that you had with this person that you've lost. Um. There's just so much that goes on. We could go on all day, but I, I can tell you um, that please don't stop using the healthy methods that you are using that are helping you to, 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 to go through the process in a manner that is, 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 is building you up again, in a manner that is helping you find your identity again. Because more than anything, um, you, you, you really, grief breaks you up and mm -hmm. build, coming back up is up to you. Unfortunately, yeah. no one or build you up again. Mm. Um, people are busy with their own yeah, lives. Yeah. People don't have time, and rightfully so, the same way you didn't have time for others when they were going through their own grieving process. With that said, um, one of the beacons of the show is to find out what anchors a person. Uh, uh, and I'm sure you've heard this many a times. Um, what's that one thing you absolutely believe in in life and you know for sure um it, it, it's something i said a few moments ago is that god is alive and he loves me 
He has a purpose for my life. And that is the same message I want to share with everybody. With, even if I don't know you, uh, God is real. He loves you. He's got a purpose with your life. I am sure of that. When, even when things don't make sense and I can't explain them. But I, I know this. Yeah. Yeah, I know this. Um, uh, Pastor Ndomiso Mazibugo has shared with us a side of his life that is not as glorious as the preaching, the, the glitz and glam, the, the, the people who serve you, your armor bearer, the, the fancy suits, all of that. Um, it, it wasn't what made up this conversation, but it showed a human side of him. It showed vulnerability. It showed that even the biggest of, of, of clergy, the people who believe in our leaders, Go through the very same things that we go through. I hope you either are affected by grieving or are in the grieving process or somebody close to you is in the grieving process. You use the conversation that we had today to reflect and to apply some of the things that Undelisa has shared. Therapy, God, medication. <laughs> As you heard, Oguti, there's different ways to find yourself and rebuild your identity when you go into the brief. I'm going to get okay. The show is Engineering Your Life and I'll see you on the next episode. epitome of luxury living. Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one